The story begins with a boy secretly watching a group of goblins gathered around a campfire. But just as he shifts his foot, a twig snaps, alerting the goblins to his presence. Without hesitation, he bolts but also the goblins hot on his ass. As he runs, a sly smile creeps across his face because this is all part of his plan. The goblins then obliviously soon tumble into a pitfall trap he'd cleverly set up earlier. The boy finally reveals his face, breathing a sigh of relief, thinking it was a close call. He's thankful for his foresight in preparing the trap, and reflects on the fact that for now, he's surviving in this world all on his own. The story then flashes back to the day when he was transported to another world. We find our protagonist Haruka, during a school lunch break, reading manga alone as usual. He admits that he's a loner but by choice. He prefers his own company, convinced that others would only disrupt his reading. Haruka describes how his classmates have split into various cliques. The gals, the delinquents, the group around the class rep, the jocks, and the nerds, everyone else he lumps into the others category. He makes it clear that he doesn't fit into any of these groups, and he's fine with that. With that thought, he tries to take a nap, but suddenly the classroom begins glowing, and everyone is stunned. Haruka however quickly spots a magic circle forming on the floor and far from panicking. He gets excited at the idea of being teleported to another world, but that excitement quickly fades as he realizes it's going to be a pain in the ass. Deciding to avoid the whole situation, he makes a break for the door in an attempt to escape the circle. But predictably the classroom doors won't budge. Unwilling to give up, Haruka frantically throws anything he can at the door in hopes of breaking it, but to no avail. In a final effort, he climbs up into the ceiling, thinking he's finally outsmarted the magic circle. He takes a deep breath, feeling safe at last, but that relief is short-lived. Another magic circle appears above him, and before he knows it, he's whisked away to the cliched white void. Haruka finds himself standing in an empty space, waiting for the usual appearance of a king, princess, or god. But instead of any grand figure, he notices an old man, sitting there looking just as lonely as him. The old-timer god then rushes toward Haruka, clearly panicked. As he mumbles, Haruka pieces together that this flustered old man is the god of another world. The god explains that Haruka's classmates have already been transported to this new world, and he's shocked to realize he missed one of them. Haruka bursts out laughing, mocking the god for not even noticing him hiding in the ceiling hatch. The god embarrassed and clearly frustrated, hurriedly tells Haruka to pick a skill so he can transport him too. Haruka is then presented with a massive list of skills, only to realize that all the cheat skills have been snatched up by his classmate. He sighs in annoyance as he sifts through the remaining scrap. One skill, dice, catches his eye. It allows him to add a point to any stat if he rolls two sixes. He chuckles at the absurdity but moves on to check the combat skills. Of course, only Kane Mastery is left a skill he deems utterly pathetic. He moves on to the starting gear and is greeted with the pitiful sight of skills called Villager Asset and some contact lenses. Sighing again, he takes a look at the magical spells, only to see mundane options like temperature control, packing, weight management, and movement spells. His skill choices are no better, general health and walking. As for job titles, his options are just as bleak shut in and neat. Finally, his list of traits includes corporate proactiveness, the utterly useless master of none, and a ridiculous blockhead trait that feels like an insult tailored just for him. Frustrated beyond belief, Haruka grabs the god and shakes him violently, yelling that he won't even make it past the starting village with this pathetic lineup. He berates the god, demanding he do his job properly and offer a better variety of skills and ability. Flustered and desperate to get rid of the stubborn loner, the god finally relents, granting Haruka all the remaining skills and shoving him into the new world. The scene then shifts, and we find Haruka alone in a forest. Before him lies the sad-looking villager set. He sighs once more and rummages through the accompanying bag, and is surprised to discover that it has an unlimited storage capacity. Inside he finds some basic gear, a wooden stick, contact lenses, and the rest of the leftover junk. Resigned to his fate, he dons the gear, trying to get into the whole otherworld vibe and then he decides to check his stats. But as Haruka attempts to open his stats window, a pop-up appears asking him to use his dice skill. Curious, he rolls the dice and gets M on both of them. Confused, he ponders what M could mean. Unable to figure it out at first, he's prompted to choose which stat to apply the points to. Knowing raw stats won't guarantee survival in this world, he decides to dump everything into his luck. When the stats window finally opens, he's shocked to see that his luck stat has maxed out. So it dawns on him that the M stands for Max. Feeling a glimmer of hope, he checks out the rest of his stats, and unsurprisingly he sees all the worthless skills he'd acquired. Amidst them, he discovers two additional skills. One is Loner, 
which ensures he can only live alone and prevents him from ever forming a party. The other is servitude, a skill that lets him command others, albeit ironically since no one would want to follow a loner. Haruka then frustratedly grumbles that his chances of getting a harem in this world just went up in smoke thanks to these garbage skills. Then as he ponders the absence of his classmates, he realizes it doesn't matter since he can't form a party anyway. So with that shit situation he decides to move on, focusing on setting up a base of operations instead. As he explores the dense forest, Haruka grumbles about the poor visibility due to the overwhelming number of trees. Then he remembers the contact lenses he stashed in his bag. He puts them on, and immediately, his vision sharpens revealing the names of all the plants and objects around him. It turns out his contact lenses grant him the appraisal skill, and suddenly, the entire world feels more accessible. Excited by this newfound power, Haruka stumbles upon some edible mushrooms with the added benefit of drawing out latent abilities. He gleefully stuffs them into his bag, knowing his magical bag can hold an unlimited amount of items. Feeling more confident, Haruka realizes that with this skill, he can locate anything he needs. Then shortly after he finds a river, fills his water bottle, and quenches his thirst. He then stumbles upon a cave and stops at the entrance, praying that no monsters are lurking inside. After a moment, he heads in. To his relief, it's pretty spacious and comfortable. He figures living here might actually be a good idea especially since he's got tents and lantern. He grabs the dry leaves and twigs he picked up earlier and uses his temperature control magic to start a fire. He hopes this will keep the beasts away. Before crashing for the night, he checks his stats. Turns out, his temperature magic has leveled up, unlocking fire magic. He's also picked up new skills like clairvoyant sight, presence detection, and enemy tracking. He figures it's probably because he's been on edge, watching for monsters. As he drifts off, he can't help but wonder what he'll do if anything shows up. He knocks out, and when he wakes up the next day, he's relieved to find no issues. He figures it's thanks to his monster-repelling items and the fact that his shut-in job title seems to protect his space. Feeling hungry, he starts a fire with his freshly unlocked fire magic and whips up some mushrooms and jerky with a sprinkle of seasoning. Then as he digs in, he's surprised at how decent it tastes. He also realizes how clutch the villager set is frying pan, knives, everything. While looking over his gear, he starts to question whether villager A was really just a villager or a survivalist. After his meal, he sits back and starts thinking about what he's going to do next. He then continues exploring the forest, thinking that the cave will serve as his base of operations for now. And the next on his agenda is setting up some proper safety measures. Then along the way, he gathers some herbs and more mushrooms, but quickly realizes that monsters are going to be his biggest headache. Just as he thinks that, he senses some presences nearby, and he sees it's two goblins. Panic sets in, but then he figures these guys are small fry, though their stats are higher than he expected. Haruka wonders if he stands a chance, but he knows that if he wants to keep exploring, there's no way around this fight. He decides to wrap his cane using his packing ability which coats objects in magic and gives them various boosts, and surprisingly it works pretty well. With newfound confidence, Haruka resolves to work hard and surpass his classmates who scored cheat skills. He charges at the goblins, his glowing cane in hand, and easily takes down the first one. The second goblin attacks, but its moves are too predictable, and Haruka dodges them without much trouble and with a quick burst of magic from his cane, he finishes the second one off. By the time evening rolls around, Haruka is cleaning up at the river, feeling proud that he survived his first battle, and he reflects that today was a good day. He then exhaustedly heads back to the cave, eats some mushrooms, and notices a wooden club he picked up from the goblins. He quickly dismisses it, thinking it's useless, it's too short in range and a bit too heavy. His trusty cane is way more efficient, Checking his stats, he's surprised to see that he leveled up just by whacking a couple of goblins, but he's not complaining. He also discovers he's gained a new skill called Magic Infusion and notices that his calisthenics level has gone up. By day 3, Haruka is already sick of eating mushrooms every damn day. He craves some meat and even laughs to himself, imagining how his class rep would definitely scold him for complaining. He then begrudgingly swallows the mushrooms and then decides to check out the Magic Infusion skill he picked up the other day. Turns out, it cloaks his body with magic and enhances it. And on top of that, it empowers his magical defense and physical control. He then also notices that his appraisal skill leveled up to level 2. However, instead of being thrilled, he's confused it now shows question marks on some of the things he tries to appraise. So he annoyedly wonders if it's more of a downgrade than an upgrade. Shrugging it off, Haruka heads into the forest, intending to practice some magic. 
but his focus is soon shattered when he spots yet another mushroom. Disappointed, he laments the lack of meat and sarcastically wonders why meat doesn't grow on trees. Then he remembers he's supposed to be practicing magic, not foraging. He activates his magic infusion skill again and starts running around the forest, feeling surprisingly light on his feet. His dexterity is off the charts. While exploring, he encounters some goblins that are a bit stronger than the ones he faced earlier, but they're still no match. He defeats them more easily than yesterday, and the confidence kicks in. He starts thinking he could probably take on three goblins at once now. But just as he's getting cocky, he spots three muscular goblins up ahead. His confidence evaporates instantly, and he ducks for cover, realizing he's outmatched. Harka ducks and hides immediately. He then starts slipping away quietly, fully aware he's not ready for that shit. Over the next few days, he sticks to a routine, hunting goblins during the day, and studying magic by night. On day 5, Haruka manages to take down a goblin with a single strike, and he also spends some time renovating his cave house, adding a gate and some not-so-fancy furniture to make it more livable. Later that night, he finally gets lucky and hunts down a rabbit for some much-needed meat. After catching the damn thing, he's pretty pumped, thinking he'll actually get to eat something other than mushrooms for once, but just as he's about to celebrate, he senses someone approaching. To his annoyance, it's the group of gals from his class. Not wanting to get mixed up with their drama, he ducks out of sight. But then he senses the damn delinquents are nearby too, and he is definitely not in the mood to deal with them either. Using his clairvoyance, Haruka scans the area and realizes the entire class is here, including the class rep's group. He doesn't want to get involved with the other group's shit, but for a second, he thinks maybe he should at least say hi to the class rep, given that they've known each other since grade school but then he snaps out of it, he's not about to start acting like a simp. In fact, he's enjoying the freedom of being completely isolated, and for the first time, no one telling him what to do, no drama, no distraction, he can live exactly how he wants. And with that thought, Haruka decides he's better off conquering this world on his own, without his classmates dragging him down to their shit. He suddenly ducks into a bush, trying to stay hidden as the delinquents approach. One of them suspicious, says he's sure he heard something and starts closing in on the bushes where Haruka is hiding. As he checks inside, all he finds is the bunny, so he and the others move on. Haruka lets out a sigh of relief they didn't spot him. Still, curiosity gets the better of him, and he decides to tail them, hoping to figure out if they're up to something. As he listens in, he quickly realizes the delinquents are just having an embarrassingly perverse conversation about the girl's melon measurements. Haruka is disappointed, having expected to learn something useful. With no real rules or consequences in this world, he's a bit worried about what these idiots might do to the girls. But he reassures himself, the class rep will probably handle it, she always does. Just as he's about to tune out, Haruka overhears the delinquents plotting to use some poor nerd named Tanaka for his abilities to do whatever they want. That's when Haruka knows they're up to no good. But getting involved? That would require actual social interaction. And let's face it, Haruka is completely against that. He retreats back to his cave and starts grilling some mushrooms, trying to shake off the whole thing. But then he notices something that hits him like a truck. His loner skill just leveled up. Even his status board now officially recognizes him as a loner. It probably leveled because he avoided his classmates all day. But still, it's not the worst thing that could have happened. Honestly, he wouldn't mind leveling up more, considering his overall level is stuck at a measly 3. The real issue though is his two skills, Master of None and Dummy skills. He has no clue how to level them up or what they even do. Master of None seems straightforward, he'll be decent at most things but never truly master anything. As for dummy skills, Haruka figures it might have something to do with puppets, but he's not really sure. So he decides to stop thinking about it for now and just focus on eating his dinner, but he still wishes he had some damn meat. Haruka calls it a night and tries to drift off to sleep, but a loud commotion outside makes that impossible, so he reluctantly gets up to see what's going on. He expects to find the usual delinquents causing trouble, but to his surprise, it's not them this time, it's the nerds. They're in the middle of fighting a group of goblins, but they're clearly struggling. Haruka considers stepping in to help, but then he checks their stats. To his disbelief their skills are leagues above his, and they're all level 16 while he's still stuck at level 3. He figures they've got this under control, so he turns to leave. But just as he's about to walk away, Haruka spots two goblins sneaking up behind the nerds. Given how much trouble they're already having, an attack from behind would wipe them out for sure. Haruka hesitates still unsure if he should get involved, but then he remembers the time the nerds shared their holographic Charizard with him back in the day. That memory is enough to push him over the edge, these guys are worth saving. So without another thought, 
Haruka charges out of the bushes, stick in hand, and one-shots both goblins in a single swing. The nerds wide-eyed and stunned, turn to see Haruka standing there, he asks if they're okay, and while they're physically fine, they're shocked to see Haruka out here in the wild. After some awkward requainting, the nerds thank him profusely, but Haruka finds it difficult to hold a conversation after all. It's been ages since he's had a proper chat with anyone. Eventually, Haruka leads them back to his cave, and the nerds are blown away by the place. Despite it being a cave, the interior is cozy and well-designed. Haruka explains that he picked up some earth magic and crafting skills to remodel the place. But the nerds still think it's incredible that he did it all on his own. He offers them drinks and asks what they were doing in the woods so late at night. That's when the mood shifts. The nerds go quiet, exchanging uneasy glances. And after a few moments of silence, they finally admit that they're on the run from the rest of the class. It all started when the class got teleported into this new world. At first everyone was just shocked by what had happened, completely blindsided. But soon reality hit, they were stuck here and panic set in. Some were calmer about it though. The popular girls seemed more annoyed than scared, as if this whole situation was just ruining their day. The delinquents were trying to figure things out, but their lack of ice sky knowledge wasn't helping. Meanwhile, the nerds were thriving this was their moment. The class rep was just as confused as everyone else. But she had enough common sense to know that bawling in the middle of an unknown forest was a sure way to attract predators and get everyone killed. So she immediately tried to get the class to calm down. But of course it was too late. A group of goblins had already caught wind of them. The class rep who usually has everything under control was completely out of her depth when it came to monsters and started to freak out. Naturally the rest of the class followed suit, even the delinquents were shaking it as we expected. The nerds however knew someone had to take charge, so they activated their skills and got to work taking down the goblins. Even the gym bros joined in. Before long the goblins were defeated, but the class still wasn't safe. The class rep pulling herself together got everyone's attention and made it clear they needed to find somewhere safe to stay before they got ambushed again. A little while later, they set up camp by the river. The nerds with all their vast ice guy knowledge took it upon themselves to teach everyone the basics of survival in this world. At first things seemed to be going smoothly. The class divided duties evenly and everyone was pitching in. But then out of nowhere, the popular girls decided that they are not going to do any damn work anymore. The class rep tried to reason with them, saying all they had to do was help set up the tents, but the girls couldn't be bothered. And of course since the popular girls weren't doing anything, the delinquents thought why should we do any shit, and they decided to be lazy too. This left the class rep and the nerds doing all the work setting up camp, gathering supplies, handling every single task. On top of that, the nerds took on the added responsibility of dealing with all the monsters that kept trying to attack the camp. It was a heavy load but they knew they had to do it for their own survival too. Back in the white room, the nerds saw two particularly disturbing skills get chosen. One was a charm spell that granted control over people, and the other was a puppeteer skill, which basically did the same thing. The nerds knew one of the delinquents had picked up the puppeteer skill, so they realized they needed to level up fast if they wanted any chance of defending themselves against them. At night, the delinquents would go out hunting monsters too, but only to grind levels so they could unlock their twisted skills. While eavesdropping on them one evening, the nerds overheard something chilling the delinquents were already planning to use their newfound power to turn the girls into their slaves once they were strong enough. The nerds knew they had to act, so they rushed to warn the class rep. Unfortunately, just a few days later, the delinquents had leveled up enough to start using their skills. Unluckily the class rep just happened to be nearby, so they set their sights on making her their first victim. But before they could make their move, the nerds jumped them. The delinquents were taken down, and their skills were sealed away, making sure they wouldn't be able to hurt anyone. The powerless delinquents were no longer a threat, and as expected, the girls were furious when they learned what had been planned. The delinquents were immediately kicked out of camp, that should have been the end of it. But the delinquents being the petty jerks they were, decided to take revenge. Later that night, while the nerds were away, the delinquents launched a sneak attack not to take control, but purely to cause chaos, so they set the entire camp on fire, burning everything to the ground. By the time the nerds got back, they were devastated. Everything they'd worked so hard to build was gone. To make matters worse, the popular girls somehow twisted the situation, blaming the nerds for provoking the delinquents and causing the destruction. Thankfully the class rep stepped in, reminding everyone that the nerds were the only reason they'd survived this long. While the nerds appreciated her defending them, they'd had enough. Staying in a camp full of ungrateful people wasn't worth it anymore, and so they decided to leave and go on the run. After hearing the nerds' whole story, 
Haruka genuinely feels bad for them, so he decides to host a mushroom feast that night. Surprisingly, he finds himself actually enjoying the company, which is a rare thing for him. But the next day, the nerds have to leave. They're planning to head downstream to find a village and start fresh as adventurers. Before they go, they invite Haruka to join them, seeing him as a friend. While Haruka does consider them friends, he declines because he's convinced that his trash skills would only slow them down. Even so he's a bit uneasy about the situation back at the class camp, mainly because the class rep, the only other person in class he respects is still there. He decides to check out the camp and see what's going on. On his way, he randomly encounters a kobold. It bites him a few times like a mad dog, but he eventually manages to kill it and continues his journey. By the time night falls, Haruka reaches the riverside where the class camp should have been, but to his surprise, the place is completely deserted. Figuring they must have moved, he uses one of his detection skills to track footprints and follows the trail until he eventually stumbles upon the popular girls. Of all the people in his class, Haruka despises dealing with them the most, so he immediately tries to turn around and head home. But it's too late they've already started chasing after him. Normally, Haruka would have no problem outrunning them, but he freezes in place when he hears them say the word please. In all the years he's known them, please has never once been in their vocabulary. Something serious must have happened to make them this desperate. So against his better judgment, he decides to hear them out. The first thing they ask is if he knows where the nerds went. Haruka hesitates, suspecting they just want to berate the nerds some more. But to his surprise, the girls actually want to apologize. They've come to realize just how much the nerds were doing for them all along, and they genuinely want to make amends for the way they treated them. But by now, the nerds are long gone, and there's no way the girls could ever catch up to them. For starters, they can't even navigate the woods alone, let alone defend themselves against the monsters lurking about. Haruka asks them how they plan to find the nerds if they can't even handle basic survival, and then he asks them if they even have the resolve to do whatever it takes to apologize. But the girls just break down in tears, knowing they wouldn't last a day out there on their own, so they beg Haruka to teach them how to survive. Haruka, completely blindsided by their sudden desperation, agrees before he can even process what he's saying. And that's when Haruka's subjugate ability kicks in, and without warning the girls become his subservient followers. So their blank stares are now fixed on him, and that terrifies. Then whenever Haruka gets into a fight, they jump in to finish off the monsters, and then present the magic crystals to him like eager puppies waiting for approval. Haruka isn't happy with how this is turning out he didn't sign up for this, and now the whole situation feels wrong. One of the girls has a small injury on her arm, so Haruka feels responsible and hands her a healing potion he made, expecting her to use it on herself, but instead she uses it on him. He's getting increasingly frustrated everything they do is only for his benefit now, and he's starting to get sick of it. What's worse he can't figure out how to undo the subjugate ability, and if he runs into the class rep, how on earth is he going to explain this? Just as he's stressing over how to release the girls from his control, the class rep appears. She tries talking to him, but Haruka is too wrapped up in his thoughts about breaking the servitude to notice her. It's only when she shouts in his ear that he snaps back to reality, realizing she's standing right next to him. Meanwhile, the delinquents are still scheming, planning to carry out their twisted ambitions with the girls, so eventually they've decided to deal with anyone who might stand in their way first. Then we see Haruka panicking because he's clueless about what to say to the class rep, and come to think of it, he doesn't even know her name. They've been in the same class since elementary school, and she's always been nice to him so she can't believe this idiot never bothered to learn her name. A few moments later, the rest of the girls from class show up. Of course, everyone except the popular girls is following the class rep's orders. Speaking of those popular girls, the class rep spots them standing behind Haruka but they look like they're sharing a single brain cell at the moment, so she figures Haruka must have done something to them. He'd love to say he's innocent, but the ugly truth is, even if he didn't mean to, his skill somehow turned them into his servants, and now he's stuck with this mess. He tries to explain without sounding like the villain, but none of the girls believe him, so Haruka just gives up trying to clear his name and starts to walk off. Too bad for him. The class rep won't let him go that easily, so she forces him to stay while she checks on Shimazaki to see if she's okay. Fortunately for him, a little shaking is all it took to snap her out of it, and Shimazaki reassures the class rep that she's fine, which gives the rep some relief. Haruka, on the other hand, thinks this is his cue to finally leave, but of course the class rep still wants to know how the whole subjugation thing happened in the first place so she's not letting Haruka go this easy. Then, while the girls are chatting, Haruka is left alone by a tree. And since he's got nothing better to do, 
he decides to practice his magic. He figures he'll try expanding his house once he gets home, so he starts experimenting, trying to figure out how to make a basement. But being Haruka, he messes it up and ends up burying himself in the ground from the neck down. So he stuck like that and sat waiting until the class rep found him. She's completely shocked to see him buried in the dirt, especially since she only asked him to wait a few minutes. But hey, boredom makes people do dumb stuff. She then goes over Haruka's head and pulls him out of the dirt, and once he's free, she apologizes for not trusting him. Apparently, Shimazaki told her that Haruka was just trying to help everyone. Haruka doesn't remember offering to help everyone, but the class rep and the other girls are already thanking him, so he just rolls with it. Then, with everything settled, Haruka is ready to head home, but the girls start getting mad because he's about to leave them stranded in the wilderness without offering any help. That's when the class rep catches on Haruka just mentioned having a home, so she immediately asks him about it and Haruka casually explains that he had some spare time and well, just built a house. The class rep is floored because she can't believe this guy managed to build an entire house by himself, while they've been struggling to manage a camp. The other girls are just as impressed, so they huddle together. Holding a quick meeting, the class rep asks Haruka how many people his house can accommodate. Haruka trying to think it through, says it could fit about 200 people, though they'd have to move some furniture around and maybe drain the indoor pool. The class rep green with envy at how well Haruka's doing for himself, reluctantly asks if she and the other girls can stay the night since you know, they're all kind of homeless at the moment. Haruka freaks out internally, it's one thing to let a few guys crash at your place, but this is a whole class full of girls, so the thought of that shit makes him feel hot like hell. But still, he manages to calm himself down, and once he's composed, Haruka leads them all toward his house. And thanks to all the time he spent wandering through these woods, Haruka is way better at navigating than the girls, and one of his skills even gives him helpful tips, keeping him headed in the right direction. Eventually, Haruka makes it back to his house with the girls in tow, and after catching their breath, they're absolutely floored by the sight. It's been ages since they've had a proper roof over their heads or enjoyed the luxury of indoor plumbing. Then the moment Haruka mentions there's a bath over that way, the girls practically stampede toward it, stripping down right in front of him. Haruka's brain short circuits there's no way he can survive a whole night under the same roof with them. So thinking quickly, he sets up a tent outside to get some much needed alone time and prepares to sleep. But just when he's about to settle in, the class rep walks into his tent. There's something she wants to talk about. First, she thanks him for all his help because without him she wouldn't have had a clue what to do. After the nerds bailed, the gym bros also left, leaving the girls to fend for themselves. It's been rough, but now that they've had a bath and a decent meal, the girls are finally in high spirits again. Even so, the class rep admits she feels like a failure as their representative, because she couldn't fix the situation on her own. But Haruka thinks she's being way too hard on herself because up until now, she's been the one protecting and keeping the girls together. She admits that may be true, but they got lucky not running into any monsters. If they had she would have been powerless to protect the class, unlike the nerds, but Haruka speaks again and points out that she's not being fair to herself because the nerds have basically spent their whole lives preparing for something like this, so of course they could handle it. But for her, this is the first time she's ever even heard of Isekai. So considering all things she's done, it's a damn good job, hearing that the class rep feels a lot better. Though she still can't help but compare her accomplishments to Haruka's after all he built a fully functioning house in just a week. Then she wishes him a good night and heads back inside. But with everything that's happened today, there's no way Haruka's getting any sleep in this hot tonight. Early the next morning, Haruka is woken up by one of the girls sitting outside his tent, telling him to get up because breakfast is ready. He is still half asleep so it takes him a moment to realize what's happening. But when it hits him, he starts freaking out a little and protests by saying that he wants to sleep in a little longer. The girl however isn't having it and climbs on top of him, trying to coax him out of bed. Haruka defeatedly gives in and asks what's for breakfast. He expects the usual, mushroom soup with a side of even more mushroom. But to his surprise, breakfast is actually fish today. So excited he accidentally headbutts the girl in his enthusiasm. She's a little hurt, but Haruka's too thrilled to care because finally he gets to eat something other than mushrooms, and he's loving every bite. The class rep confused by his excitement, asks why he's so worked up about eating fish when he's been living next to the river this whole time. Haruka admits that while that's true, he absolutely sucks at fishing, which is why he's never managed to catch any. Seeing how the girls seem so accustomed to eating fish, 
Haruka asks how they manage to catch them so easily. The class rep agrees to show him and takes Haruka to the river, along with one of the girls who has a lightning magic skill. Her method is simple but effective. She just electrocutes the water until the fish well stop being alive. Haruka is amazed and begs her to do it again, though she's reluctant. She agrees since Haruka has been helping out. She summons another ball of lightning, but before she can throw it in the river, Haruka quickly grabs it and seals it with his packing skill. He tosses it into the water himself and catches some fish, but on top of that, he gains lightning magic as well, meaning he won't need lightning girl's help anymore. The class rep then confusedly asks what he just did, so Haruka explains that by using his packing skill on a particular element, he gains that type of magic. It's probably a result of all the different skills he has, which is definitely useful, but in Haruka's mind, he's still stuck with a bunch of useless abilities. Then while the other girls splash around in the river, Haruka sits with the class rep and asks what she and the others plan to do next. The class rep admits the details are still a bit unclear, but their goal is to head for the nearest village and try to catch up with the nerds. However, she adds they'll need to level up if they're going to make it out of this forest on their own. So Haruka trying to be helpful, offers to train them before they leave. Then not long after, all the girls are gathered in the forest for Haruka's impromptu training camp. But before they start, Haruka asks what their current levels are. When they tell him they're all above level 15, Haruka feels an immediate pang of depression because he's still stuck at level 7 after all this time in the forest. So he begins to wonder if they even need his help at all. Then to test their abilities, he sets them up to fight a group of kobolds to see how they handle themselves. The girls think this will be a walk in the park, since the kobolds are only level 6. But a few moments later, all of them had their butts handed to them, and they were knocked out on the ground. Turns out, none of them expected the kobolds to actually fight back. So bruised and humiliated, they retreat to regroup and strategize. But oddly enough the strategy meeting ends up taking place inside Haruka's magic tent, thanks to its ability to expand, they all fit comfortably. But Haruka still has no idea why they chose his damn tent for this. After some deliberation, the girls head back out confident they've got it this time. Haruka is glad they're feeling motivated, but in the back of his mind, he's not convinced they'll win round two either. Then once they leave, the girl who woke him up that morning approaches him, looking a bit sheepish. She apologizes for her behavior earlier. Apparently she was deliberately getting close to him to see if he'd try to take advantage of the situation. She admits she didn't trust him at first, but now, after he's given them shelter, food, and even offered to train them, she feels like she can trust him, so she adds that she'll be back tomorrow to wake him up with breakfast again. Haruka feeling relieved that she trusts him now, smiles and says he's looking forward to tomorrow. However, since he still doesn't know her name, he decides he'll just call her Fish Girl for now. The next morning, Haruka is thrilled to get another fish from Fish Girl, but then overhears the other girls talking about going back to fight the kobolds for revenge. But before they can rush off, the class rep calls them back, reminding them that they'll definitely lose again if they don't train first. So she suggests they start by fighting goblins instead. However, when the girls actually face off against the goblins, it's a complete disaster. But despite this setback, some of the girls are still convinced they're ready for a kobold rematch, while others start mysteriously coming down with sudden illnesses to avoid fighting anymore. Haruka doesn't have high hopes for this, and he's fully prepared to jump in if things go south. But to his surprise, the girls actually learned from their mistakes with the goblins and managed to work together to defeat the kobolds. The class rep congratulates them on their victory, and Haruka feels a wave of relief because this means the girls can handle themselves now and he can finally go back to his peaceful life as a loner, but at least that's what he thinks, because the class rep walks over and thanks him for agreeing to come with them to the nearest village. Harka knows for a fact that he never said he'd join them, but class rep is pretty insistent, so in the end, he caves and agrees to go with her. A little while later, everyone's packed up and ready to leave the forest. Haruka reminds them they don't know what dangers they might run into out there, so they should stay on guard. Meanwhile, in another part of the forest, one of the boys from their class is seen frantically running for his life. He makes the mistake of looking back and trips over a rock, only to find himself cornered by his attacker. And with no escape, he's strangled to death in the instant. Thanks for watching. Subscribe to not miss the next part.